Hello. And welcome to UC Berkeley's uh, Summer Staff Appreciation Week keynote. My name is Kate Lewis, and I'm an Associate Director in the Industry Alliances Office. And I'm also the, currently the co-chair of the Chancellor Staff Advisory Committee, also known as CSAC. CSAC is one of the staff groups that has advocated for the creation of appreciation and recognition events for staff, which includes Summerfest and includes Staff Appreciation Week in the summer, fall, and spring. I hope you can stop by tomorrow during Summerfest to visit our table. The keynote today is the kickoff to Staff Appreciation Week events for this summer. Today we will hear from Dr. Jen Strauss from the Berkeley Seismological Laboratory, which is the oldest organized research unit here at UC Berkeley. Tomorrow, we, will, we hope to see you at our annual Summerfest event, enjoying the food, games, visiting our staff org tables, music, and much more. On Friday, join us for UC Walks, great prizes, and the flash mob. Check out the Staff Appreciation Week webpage for more information about all of these events and everything else about Staff Appreciation Week. I would also like to introduce James Dudek, who's our campus, <laughs> our campus employee experience lead. If you have any questions or suggestions or recommendations for Staff Appreciation or Staff Appreciation Week, you can reach out to James. Um, he can be reached at jdudek at berkeley.edu. You can also talk to him after our, our keynote today. Joining Berkeley in 2012, Dr. Jen Strauss serves as the scientific liaison for the Berkeley Seismological Laboratory and heads the Earthquake Research Affiliates Program. She also serves as the Northern California Regional Coordinator and Vice Chair of the Joint Committee for Communication, Education, and Outreach for the ShakeAlert Early Earthquake Warning System. She recently wrote the Early Earthquake Warning Chapter for Haywired, the Hayward Fault Scenario, which is a regional and statewide earthquake preparedness initiative that aims to shift behavior about earthquakes and ensure that everyone is prepared. And that was released earlier this year. I encourage you to check that out too if you haven't already. As a staff member at UC Berkeley, Jen has collaborated with staff, faculty, and students to further the study of the science behind earthquakes, foster innovation, and further the, de the development of novel technologies for geophysical research. For more information about BSL, check out their website at earthquakes.berkeley.edu. And without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Jennifer Strauss. Thank you, Kate, and thank you to everyone who's joining um, in person and online. Um, we're going to have a bit of fun for this presentation. Um, I hope it's a little interactive. Um, I hope you all will participate in our quiz time later. Um, I'm going to be here discussing earthquake hazards in the Bay Area, what you need to know about living in earthquake country, um, address some of the science that we study at the Seismology Lab to learn more about this earthquake hazard and put products and initiatives in place so that we can better bounce back from earthquake hazards. Um, we're also going to spend a little bit of time at the end dispelling some common myths about earthquakes. So I hope you find this talk enjoyable and not just scary. <laughs> um, so normally um, when you talk about California, you talk about earthquakes. Um, we have earthquake hazards in this area. Um, it's one of the most active places in the United States for earthquakes. Um, this map that's on the left is from the Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast. And what it does is it looks at movements on the fault that have happened in the past, looks at ruptures that have happened on different faults in the past, and then tries to decide on a set of probabilities, the likelihood that that piece of the fault is going to rupture. And they do this on a time frame, right? You have to associate probabilities with some time frame. So what they chose to do is do it based on a 30-year plan. What happens over the course of 30 years that you might have to worry about in terms of earthquakes? The mortgage on your house, right? So this is a good tool for people to look at if you're about to become a homeowner so that you know what is the likelihood that your residence will experience a damaging earthquake above magnitude 6.7 in the next 30 years. So you can see, well, 
We got two main problems in the Bay Area. We have the northern part of the San Andreas Fault, which has about a 33% probability of having that size of a rupture. And then we also have the Hayward Fault, which goes right through our campus. Not only just right through our campus, but right through our stadium, right? <laughs> kind of splits it in half. And so um, people have been working to try to understand um, how these ruptures. This doesn't mean that for sure this is going to happen. This is an estimate of what the probability is. And so a lot of people have been working very hard on campus to um, increase our resiliency to the earthquakes because this is such a hazard for our area. OK, that sort of sets the stage. Now, as Kate mentioned, um, I helped work on the haywired scenario, which is kind of like an imagination of what, what could happen. What could happen if there was a magnitude 7 earthquake under Oakland on April 18th, 2018, at around 4 in the afternoon? What would happen? What does that look like? How are our various industries affected? How are our people affected? And you start propagating that out into the two years after that event and see what happens. So what does happen according to the scenario? 411,000 people displaced from their homes. We have um, six weeks of water outages in some areas. In certain really fragile areas, you have up to six months of water loss. You have um, fire. Fire following earthquake is one of the most destructive pieces of after earthquake events. 400 fire ignitions. That's much more than a lot of our fire capabilities are. You have an estimate of 800 deaths, 1,800 injuries. And all of this totals up into a two-year cost of $82 billion. OK, those are pretty sobering numbers. And you may be thinking all of a sudden, gosh, this is Summerfest. Why did you bring me here? This is really terrible. I was going to get some lunch, but my friend told me to come here, and now this is awful. OK, well, we're at a university, right? So knowledge is power. As I said before, the haywired scenario is a make-believe scenario of what could happen with the way things are right now. You think about those probabilities I showed on the previous slide. Those are 30% chances over the course of 40 years. We can do a whole lot to change these numbers. And that's in, the entire purpose of this scenario is to give people tools to actually do an analysis of what their vulnerabilities are, what their fragilities are, so that they can then address those problems. A lot of times, if you talk about big, massive earthquakes that are going to cause calamity, sometimes it's just too hard. It's like, why even bother? There's nothing I can do. But if you break it up into little chunks and actually look at, OK, which water pipes cross the fault? Which ones are there? Maybe we prioritize fixing those ones first. And that can do a lot to increase your resiliency and your ability to cope with the aftermath. And I just lost my clicker. OK, here we go. So we know there's going to be infrastructure damage and fires. We know that there's going to be buildings that don't stand up to the earthquake. So what can we do about it? Talk to your landlord or if you're a homeowner, look at your house. Is there retrofitting that can be done? Sometimes there's even grants that you can get from the state to finance said retrofit. So there you go, win for everybody. We can look at fire infrastructure, having water available to put out fires, perhaps use things like early warning, we're going to talk about later, to reduce ignition hazards. If you can turn off a gas line, gas can't start a fire. We know that loss of power, internet, and cell service is going to be something that we're going to have to face. It happens after a lot of different calamities. So how do we build ourselves resiliency so that we're not all just compelled to our cell phone, right? Like, we, we got to live outside of that technology bubble a little bit. Um, and then workplace disruption. The UC Berkeley campus puts on, almost every two years, a disaster exercise. And for the past two of those exercises, for sure, they've been about earthquakes. And different subject matter experts from transportation, from the Tang Center, from the emergency management groups have gotten together and started mapping out responses for the campus. So number one, if you're interested in that sort of thing, see how you can get involved. 
Number two, that's a good time of year to be sitting and thinking, well, have I talked to my supervisor? Or if I'm a supervisor, have I talked to my employees about what they're supposed to do? Can they work remotely? If they're allowed to work remotely, have they ever done that? Do they have a VPN set up on their computer to do that? Do they know what to do if they can't get to campus? Um, are they a key personnel that needs to get to campus? Um, these are things that you can work out before the disaster and give everybody a bit of empowerment to, to feel a little more um, able to tackle these sort of issues. Okay, so we know those are gonna be problems. So what can we do about it? Well, normally we learn about earthquakes by seeing everything that happens after it. We can see the landscape changing, we can see things breaking, we can see things needing to be rebuilt. But these scenarios give us an opportunity to imagine that happening without having to live it, and then to change what we're going through. So here at the Berkeley Seismology Lab, we are not only working on these scenarios to help imagine what happened, but also try to put together scientific tools so that we can understand the earthquake problem a little bit better and have people be able to take actions in response to that. And we do this because we have super awesome staff, okay? So um, our mission is of uh, sound sci science serving society. Uh, we put out earthquake information. Um, when you hear stuff that the USGS puts out, earthquake, magnitudes, location, a lot of the work that goes behind that sort of notification comes from the staff at UC Berkeley. And so we all work together to make, you know, make living in earthquake country not so bad. Um, so I just wanted to recognize the really great staff at the BSL and give them all a shout out because they're super awesome. Okay, so what's one of the projects that staff, researchers, faculty, and students all work on together to, um, to work on resiliency? Well, earthquake early warning. Some of you may have heard about the Shake Alert project. Um, it's been in the news over the past couple of years. Um, it's, Goal is to provide earthquake early warning. This is not earthquake prediction. This is not a probability forecast. This is information that an earthquake has happened and the shaking is headed your way and hopefully we get that message to you before the shaking gets to you. So we have sensors all up and down the west coast of the United States. When an earthquake happens, the fault breaks that big, huge piece of rock moving against that whole other big, huge piece of rock makes a lot of energy release, okay? And the energy and different types of energy move at different rates. So you have some wave fronts, like the P wave in this very lovely diagram here that's in yellow. It's a compressional wave front, and it travels at about twice the speed of what we call the S wave, which is a more translational wave, which is more of the damaging shaking, okay? So if you can look at the P wave, if you can measure that on your sensors, if you can characterize something about that P wave quick enough, then you can send communications that travel close to the speed of light faster than that S wave can get to you, which travels close to the speed of sound in rock. Okay, we are not talking about very large prediction times like for hurricanes where you get days, or tornadoes, where maybe you get 30 minutes. We are talking about zero seconds, or seconds, or tens of seconds, okay? This is all very fast. Nobody is putting together a go bag, or getting their house retrofitted, or any of these things <laughs> in that amount of time, right? You need to just like focus and go, okay? But this is the thing that we're working on all together. So this video, which is already playing good, um, is a little demonstration of how, how that could possibly happen. And this is very thanks to staff um, over at the Clark Kerr Center um, and over at the uh, Public Affairs who helped put us, this together for us. Once there was a bull named Bill who felt a certain thrilling chill each time he saw a china shop. The teacups made his heart flip-flop. He couldn't help but to cry and pout. For each store sign read, bulls keep out. Earthquake, drop, cover, Children, hold. Children, there's an earthquake, duck, cover, and hold. Earthquake, 
Drop cover hold on. Strong shaking expected. Earthquake. Drop cover hold on. Are we ready? Yes, we're ready! Are we ready? Yes, we're ready! <laughs> Nothing quite gets one's message across. <laughs> Nothing quite gets one's message across like a bunch of adorable preschoolers. So we milk that video for all we can. Um, but this is not really a pie in the sky, like, oh, maybe one day we could do this crazy thing called earthquake early warning. This is happening. We are about to launch a limited rollout this year. We work together with um, University of Oregon, University of Washington, Caltech, the United States Geological Survey, and with funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to bring earthquake early warning to California. This is proven technology. It's being worked on by 27 different pilots around um, the west coast of the United States. These include groups like Bay Area Rapid Transit, PG&E, Chevron, um, LA Metro. We're focusing on five target sectors, emergency management, utilities, healthcare, transportation, and education. And we're trying to bring this to the west coast of the United States. We have support from Congress who's funding us. We have support from the states that are funding us to make this a reality. So people can use those precious seconds to try to take protective action so that, again, we can change these numbers that are in the scenarios. And so this has uh, been a long time coming. We've been working on this, um, man, since about 2006. Started working with external stakeholders in 2012. Um, the full public rollout is not going to be happening in 2018. Um, that's because we do not have infrastructure in the United States to get an alert out to every single person in sub one second time frames just doesn't exist. So we're having to build this from the ground up. But it won't be just useful for earthquake early warning. You can use it for all other different scenarios once we get this thing done. So that's the proven technology piece that we're um, working toward to bring more resiliency to places like the Bay Area. But we also don't stop there. We have new research initiatives that are looking at how can we take this a step farther? How can we learn more? And one of those things is the MyShake project. Now, the MyShake project is pretty similar to what we're trying to do with ShakeAlert, um, except that this is the research side of things. Um, so this is a citizen science initiative that instead of using all of the sensors in the ground, these very high quality instruments that could even feel your heartbeat if you're standing just a few feet away from the device, instead we're using devices that probably most people in this room have in their pocket, and it's a smartphone. There's a little accelerometer in your smartphone that knows if you have it in portrait or landscape mode, or if you're playing some sort of crazy game or something, it knows if you've tilted it this way or the other. Well, that same sensor can be used to measure earthquakes, not as well as the high quality sensors, but enough that we can use it. And because there's a lot more of you then there are sensors. We can add and aggregate all of this information together to get not only a better idea of what's happening in the rupture, but also get much more coverage. So the way this works is it has an artificial neural network on board the phone that looks at a certain set of features and decides, is that feature more indicative of an earthquake? Or is that feature more indicative of a human activity? Okay, when we think about earthquake shaking, we think about really violent shaking, things moving, things falling. But actually, human activities can get a lot more crazy than earthquake shaking, right? Like, one G of earthquake shaking is like super crazy earthquake, right? How easy is it for me to do one G? 
That's more than one G, right? I lifted off the ground. I, I, I overcame gravity for a very split second of time. Um, so these different types of features can be tracked, and you can map them, OK? Human emotions kind of end up in a different part of the graph than all of the earthquake motions. And this is very much true if you use more than just two features. So you start stacking these things. You start learning what human activities look like, what earthquakes look like. And then the phone can decide itself, was this an earthquake, or was it just Jane walking down the street? So we take that information. You can send it up to the cloud. You aggregate it with all of the other phones in the area with the hope that one day we can use that to provide earthquake early warning. Now, why is that important? Jen, you just told me we have this lovely rollout of the Shake Alert system happening in 2018. Why are you wasting your time? Well, because California is not the only place that is earthquake country. Right? There are earthquakes happening all over the globe. And there are also earthquakes happening in places that have very high seismic risk, but very low infrastructure to deal with things like having a world-class seismic network with 24-7 monitoring and a world-class research institution behind it. Okay? We've identified 496 earthquakes globally with the MyShake app. These go from the very small earthquakes to the very large earthquakes, very shallow quakes to the very deep quakes. And this gives you the opportunity to not only perhaps one day bring earthquake early warning to underserved countries in the world, but it also gives us the ability to harness a global seismic network that is the largest on the planet. You start talking about millions and millions of phones contributing to one network, to one vision. Imagine the amount of science that you could do with that. Imagine the difference in the amount of data. You know, we can't predict earthquakes right now. One of those reasons is because we don't have a lot of information on a lot of earthquakes. You know, we just don't have them. These large events, even globally, don't happen on a repeatable scale where you can get great data to just run every scenario that your mind can dream up. And so the more data, the more we can understand about earthquake processes, the more we can do about it and understand why this is happening to us. So that's why we're working on the MyShake project and the Shake Alert project. And this is just part and parcel of the science that we do in the seismology lab, including things like tomography studies and volcanism studies and all of these things to better understand um, earth science as it's happening around. OK, so why is this important? Why do we love this? Because it is not a matter of if but when. And I cannot give a quote a attribution to this because pretty much everyone anywhere says this, right? This is just, this is just something that happens. OK, so, so what can you do? What can you take away from this talk today? Um, many of you might not be super interested in tomography or P wave versus S wave wave propagation speed or directions. You might not have this burning desire to come work at the BSL. But maybe you can do a little bit to make your resiliency plan yourself a little bit better. So I'm giving you all homework. Right. I, I know it's summertime, but this is your, this is your summer fest, uh, summer school here. OK, so your homework assignment is to complete the next seven steps that I'm going to take you through, which are the seven steps to earthquake resilience put together by the Earthquake County Alliance. And you do not need to do all of these today. It is a long-term project. Maybe work on one a month. So in the next seven months, you will be ready. OK, step number one, take some notes. Secure your space, right? We do not want any giant vases or you know, priceless piece of art hung up over your bed. We do not want giant bookcases that are not strapped to the walls, things that are very, very heavy on top shelves. Um, this does not mean you have to go like completely crazy and museum putty like all of your drinkware to everything. No, like, be reasonable. If it looks like it's you know, here or higher on you and it could fall and crush you, strap it down. If it's a pillow on a high shelf, probably it's fine. OK? Look at your surroundings, not only in your house, but in your place of work, right? A lot of us spend a lot of time here at UC Berkeley. You need your office to be as lovely as your home. OK? So work on that. Secure your space. Step number two, make a plan. So 
In this whole context of us living in a wired world, a wired community, we're all on our cell phones. We all, you know, we don't even know if we have bread at home. We're texting somebody like, did you get the bread? Oh, I don't know. Is the store still open? I don't know. Ask Google. Um, <laughs> if, if, the, if the communications go down like they have gone down in almost every single calamity, you need to have a plan. You need to not have to call your loved ones, your children, the, whoever's taking care of your pets, and then have the nice 30-minute conversation of how you're going to get to them, where you're meeting them, and so on. Um, many of us in the Bay Area don't work where we live. Right? I live on the peninsula. My whole family is over on that side of the water. I need to have a plan to let them know, am I coming to you? Are we both meeting somewhere else? What is our plan? I don't want to have to rely on texting getting through in that sort of areas. When I was a kid, you went to the mall, you know, nobody had cell phones. They didn't have those things. You know, it was like your mom telling you, we're meeting by the fountain in 30 minutes if you go off, right? It's, it's like that. It doesn't have to be crazy detailed, but get a plan together. Okay, organize your supplies. The BSL has put together a really, I like to think, great video on building an emergency kit. You want to have about 72 hours worth of food and drink so that you can get through those first three days. Because if the roads are crazy, Red Cross is not getting to people you know, 30 minutes after the event. It's just not happening. Um, medicine, if you are somebody who relies on medicine to live your life to the fullest, make sure you have extra. Um, you want to have cash. Again, with the power being down, cash is going to be king. You're not going to be able to use your ATM card to get some extra money because you are hungry. Okay, the other thing to think about is the 70, 72 hours is a guideline. Some people go a little bit less. Some people go super crazy with this bunker in their back garage with, you know, six months worth of food. And on, on the outset, that seems a little simple, sensible, right? Like, oh, you're ready for anything if you have six months worth of food and water. But number one, that's a lot of food and water to have to replace as stuff expires, you know? It's a little wasteful. Number two, we talked about buildings and retrofits. Do people understand that, number one, the building code, because it is rated for life safety, does not mean it is occupiable after the event? I will say that again. Just because your building or place of business is rated for life safety does not mean it is immediately occupiable after the event. That means that your life will be safe and you can exit the building. Okay? So it does no good if you've got six and a half months worth of food and water in a bunker in your basement somewhere if the building inspectors come by and say, I am very sorry, you're red tagged. You can also get red tagged for your building even if your building is completely fine. The building next to yours is going like this towards your building. They're not letting you back in that building to get your water. They're just not. It's unsafe for you to be there. And so you want to be nimble, you want to be mobile, you want to have plans and contingency plans so that you can do what you need to do, okay? Again, this is going to affect certain areas. It's not going to affect other areas. It may take you a while to get other places, but this is not, we're not talking Armageddon and everything is like, you know, whole western part of the United States is just down for the count. That's not what's happening. So just have a reasonable plan so that you can chill and decide what to do next. Okay, secure your affairs. This goes with retrofitting your own place of residence, talking to your landlord if you do not own your place and seeing what they have done, <clears throat> getting your documents together, making sure if you choose to have earthquake insurance that you have that set up and filed before the event because they're not going to let you sign up for it after the event, right? Okay. When the earthquake happens, what do we do? Drop, cover, hold on. Okay, every fall, there is an annual shakeout exercise that is put together by the Earthquake County Alliance. How many people in this room, and please audience on the internet, participate even though I can't see you. How many of you, when that happens, do you actually drop, cover, and hold on? That is so good. I'm glad to see all those hands, and shame on you, the other hands, okay? <laughs> 
The whole point of doing an exercise like that is not so that people can regurgitate the words drop, cover, hold on when asked that question. The whole point of doing this exercise is so that it is muscle memory. So that when you feel the shaking, you immediately drop. And you already have located the place that is safest in your office or your home or your school if you're picking people up from there. You've already figured that all out and you've practiced it. So that in those couple seconds that you have before the shaking gets crazy, you're not then putting together your disaster preparedness plan, right? Work on the five Ps. Proper prior planning prevents seven Ps, right? Seven Ps, okay? So, drop, cover, hold on. We've got two more. After the event happens, we want to evacuate. You are all going to have to evacuate on this campus from your building after an earthquake. It doesn't matter if you are in the most fancy uh, Hearst Memorial Mining building with all its base isolators. You're, the building people are going to make you get out. I don't care if you got a fancy thing that you got to do, they're going to make you get out. And so evacuate, help other people who can't get out, help your community. We all are in this together. It is not, you know, a solo mission. And finally, we restore, we build better, we do better, okay? And we can all get through this together. There have been earthquakes that have happened in this area before. There will be ha earthquakes that happen again. We are all still here. We are all still together. We can do this. Okay, so I've talked about earthquake hazards and freaked you out a little bit. We've talked about earthquake science. And we've talked about ways that you can prepare and get yourself ready to do the best that you can when faced with an earthquake rupture. So I gave you your homework assignment, and now it's pop quiz time, OK? So I'm going to have my lovely assistants, Kate and James, uh, here. And we're going to have five pop quiz questions. And I do hope that people um, watching online participate as well and jot down your answers, and we'll see if you get them all right. And so this is where we confirm or bust some myths um, about earthquakes that happen. And we're going to make use of Hollywood to help us through this scenario. So first up, we have the movie. Oh, my lens. Where's my mouse? Yeah, what? How am I going to click on this? My mouse is. Oh, you can see it on the screen. Thank you. Okay, everybody gets bonus credit for helping the uh, <laughs> helping the person who can't see where everything went. Oh, my lands. There we go. Here we go. Okay. 2012, the movie was released in 2009. Just to be super confusing, Earthquake swallows Los Angeles, starring John Cusack. Come on, play my video. Okay, so what do we think about that one? Is that, is that confirmed or busted? Earthquake swallows Los Angeles in this epic fashion. Any confirms? Okay. Y'all are all very good at this game. It's totally busted, right? OK, so, so number one, earthquakes don't like swallow things in like giant chasms like that. Earthquakes can do some really like crazy things, like create waterfalls where there were none to have existed before. They can cause very long rifts. They cause a bunch of the beautiful like landscape that we have around here in the Bay Area. But there's not this like magma-filled chasm that opens up and swallows like entire cities. It's just completely and utterly insane. OK. <laughs> Next one, we have The Rock, Wayne Johnson. Dwayne Johnson. Um, movie San Andreas 2015, tsunami warning signs. We gotta go. Water being pulled out like that's a tsunami. Okay, water being pulled out like that is a tsunami. Tsunami warning signs. Confirmed or busted? Confirmed. We got some confirms. Any busteds? Okay, okay, very good. This is confirmed. 
Okay, if you are ever on the shoreline and you feel super heavy shaking, you want to run, right? You want to get out because that is a tsunami side. But water being pulled out in, in a big fashion like that is also a tsunami warning sign, okay? And so just keep that in mind. Don't wait for like your neighbor to say, say anything. You need to tell your neighbor we got to go, okay? Now, what you probably don't want to do if you see tsunami warning signs like that, though, is drive your boat towards the tsunami. So continuing on in the same scene from San Andreas, um, I, I did both of these because I really wanted to get this take home message here. Okay, don't drive your boat towards the tsunami. Okay, so this is what we call a tidal bore. So, um, mega tsunami in San Francisco Bay. Confirmed or busted? We got any confirms? Got a couple of confirms. Okay, this one's a little trickier, right? Because we've seen, you've seen movie features about this, right? Or you've seen on the news about tidal bores, these really big things. But I will assuage some concerns and say that this one Mega tsunami in the bay is actually busted for a couple reasons, okay? First reason is San Francisco Bay doesn't have that much water. We just don't. It's not that deep or big of a bay, right? So even if you, like, pulled almost all the water out, it's not going to make this, like, huge tidal bore in the Pacific Ocean, okay? That's just that's not, not reasonable. Okay, number two, the type of earthquakes that we get in the San Francisco Bay Area are called strike-slip earthquakes for the most part. So the plates move side to side past each other, okay? If you've ever taken any blocks inside water and move stuff side to side, it doesn't really do a whole lot. What does a whole lot? Up and down motion. So if you have uplift of plates, you have big thrust events happening, that's what causes a tsunami because the ocean floor rises up and then that water has to go somewhere, okay? So generally speaking, you're going to get tidal bore effects for near shore events. So Japan, during a large event, could get something resembling that, though they usually get what's thought of as a normal tsunami, where it's just floods of water and water and water and water coming all after the other. Um, so we don't have that kind of scenario here in the Bay Area. So we're not likely to get anything resembling this. But still, take home message, do not drive your boat towards the tsunami. OK. <laughs> Next one. We have Lex Luthor here. It occurs to me that a 500 megaton bomb planted at just a proper point would, uh, would destroy most of California. Millions of innocent people would be killed. And the West Coast as we know it would fall into the sea. Bye-bye, California. <laughs> okay. So, bomb-induced megaquake. Is this, is this plausible? Can we confirm that if somebody was nefarious enough to drop some bombs on a fault line, that they could induce a big, giant earthquake? Busted. Any confirms? Confirmed. One confirmed. <laughs> OK. The busteds win. OK. So a couple things here. Number one, it would, be, it would just be the calamity unknown past all calamities that anybody has observed over Earth to have California just fall into the ocean like that. OK, number one. Number two, as we said again, strike slip plates, right? So, so big movements would just have it, LA become a suburb of San Francisco, not that it's all going to crash into the ocean, much you know, to the chagrin of Lex Luthor. OK, the other thing is, is we spoke about before about the amount of energy that it takes to move two huge, massive pieces of rock past each other, right? And how compression waves can move faster than transverse waves because all of that motion just, it's huge, it's huge. Just think about lifting like a normal rock that you find in your backyard. That's really heavy. Now we're talking about like hundreds of miles of rock. Like, no, we do not have anything man-made that is going to make that big of an energy release. We just don't have it. And so that's not feasible, mega bomb. And so somebody, knowledgeable person in the audience might say, but, 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 Jen, 
I hear all the time people talking about like, well, if we could just induce a whole bunch of little tiny earthquakes, right? That would be the same thing as one giant one, right? No, that's also a myth because the earthquake magnitude scale is not a linear scale, okay? A magnitude four quake is not twice as big as a magnitude two quake. Each one of those is an exponential scale. So you'd actually need 32 magnitude twos to equal one magnitude three. Then you need another 32 magnitude threes, which is like 900 and something magnitude twos to equal one magnitude four. You keep going up that list to where we're talking about a mega quake of like magnitude 9.5 that happened in Chile in the 60s. It's just absurd. You can't do it. So we do not need to fear Lex Luthor and his terrible minions dropping everything into Los Angeles and building a new subdivision. Okay, so um, these were all really high budget movies. The next one is gonna be a made for TV movie. So since I had to, you know, yank it um, off of uh, just video clips, the video quality is not so great, but it still was wonderful. So I had to show it. Okay, where's my mouse? Come back here, come here there. Okay, so this is from the made for TV movie, the big one. The Great Los Angeles Earthquake, which was in 1990. Ah! Come back here. Then the seismic readings are coordinated between here and Berkeley and the USGS office in Golden, Colorado to determine the exact magnitude of each earthquake. Get some shots of this. We'll use them for background cuts. In the you got it. Okay, Doc, how about the big one? When's it going to happen? As I've already said, Mr. Conrad, I'm a scientist, not a fortune teller. Your guess is as good as mine. Okay, so earthquake prediction. Is your guess as good as mine? <laughs> this, this is when people stop wanting to answer questions, right? <laughs> okay, so, so, so earthquake prediction. Your guess is as good as mine. Is that confirmed or not? When, right? <laughs> very good, very good. Um, so we're talking prediction, not just, just forecasting, like saying, on April 16th of 2030, there's going to be a magnitude six earthquake in Chile at four in the morning. No, we can't do that. So it is confirmed that earthquake prediction is your guess as good as mine. I really like this clip for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, uh, this movie was set at this fictitious seismology lab that sounded a whole lot like Caltech, okay? Um, and so, it is very much true that number one, Caltech, UC Berkeley, and the USGS coordinate together to provide earthquake information to all of the people around here. Um, that's how it's happened, that's how we work. Um, the other cool thing about this clip is this is kind of like my life. You know, people walk around and say, so can you answer me some questions about earthquake science? And um, they always ask the same thing, when's the big one coming? You know, can we predict earthquakes? Can I take a shot of your helicorder in the corner that is this really old 1950s technology that they just won't stop filming? And we saw a couple of those in that scene. So this is basically what I wanted to give y'all just a little flavor of. Um, this kind of short talk is not really, can't really do a deep dive into any one of these topics, but if you want to learn more about any of the research we do, um, you can go to our website um, at earthquakes.berkeley.edu or follow us on Twitter at Berkeley Seismo. If you wanna learn more about the MyShake project or get signed up for details, then follow us at MyShake app on Twitter. And right now, the app is available for Android on the Google Play Store. Um, hopefully, by the end of the year, we'll have a brand new version on iOS as well. So um, if you want to learn more about that, you can send an email to us um, and ask to get on a mailing list. And if you have any questions, you can always email me, jastrauss at berkeley.edu. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, I have a question about stop or drop, cover, and hold. Yes. What if you are, say, walking across Memorial Glade and you're in a big open area? Do you still drop you, and cover? Yeah, that, and that is a really great question because at first you'd be like, what is beating me in the head here? I'm on a big grassy knoll, right? But the, um, the motions, especially of those S waves, that S wave trave is transverse motion, okay? So if you can imagine walking 
onto a piece of carpet and somebody pulling the carpet out from under you, right? If you're standing up tall and walking, you're gonna fall, unless you're like some crazy acrobat or whatever, like you're gonna fall, okay? But if you're already dropped on the ground and your center of gravity is lower, you might tip over, but you're less likely to like break a leg, okay? And so that's the purpose behind the drop prescription is that you never know when the floor is gonna like all of a sudden move over here because you're not coupled to the floor, right? You're not attached. Even though gravity holds you down, you're not attached. So if it goes that way, you're not going with it. Um, the other thing is, is drop is not feasible for all people, right? If you're in a wheelchair, if you've got a walker or whatever. Um, so Earthquake County Alliance, their website has a lot of good resources to where if that um, applies to you or one of your loved ones, you can look at what some of their suggestions are for that. So, so you definitely want to drop first, okay? Drop is always the first thing you can do because then you have agility to go and make further decisions. In this room, um, the biggest issues are these non-structural hazards. So people in the front row, <laughs> sorry. Um, people back there, you're kind of, I know. <laughs> They're the ones filling out your paperwork. Uh, this is no good. Um, we need them a tent or something. No, so, so uh, the most important thing to protect is obviously the back of your head, okay? And not like, oh, I'm protecting the back. No, you need to like go down and, and like protect it, okay? Then what you can do is you can figure out, okay, what do I do next, okay? When you come in, you can like case the room and be like, okay, you know, I'm okay here. Seats, pull a seat down, put my head under it. Even if you're not gonna fit under it, you know, you can at least brace your head. Generally speaking, you don't want to stand in a doorway that's because doorways have doors, right? And so what's the last thing you need to be doing? Standing in a door jam and have the door whack you in the face as soon as it moves, okay? There was sort of old pictures going around of people like standing in these wood frame doorways and these beautiful adobe houses that fell down and they survived because they were standing in the doorway. Okay, if, if this was an adobe building, I'd say the same thing, right? Like your best bet is that piece of wood to stand under, but we're not in an adobe hut. So let's not stand by the doors. Let's try to get away from non-structural hazards. Please do not fight your neighbor for a place. You know, let's just all crouch down. And then when the shaking's over, you can get out of the building. If you are in a dangerous spot and you have to get out, then again, drop and crawl out because it does you no good if you end up breaking your leg trying to walk out. A question in the back. I heard uh, Richard Allen a couple months ago on forum the lab director talking about uh, cuts or the threat of cuts in federal funding for extending the uh, early warning system to Cascadia and other regions that mm -hmm. don't have the full deployment of sensors. And you alluded earlier to having congressional funding, at least for the California portion. So can you uh, talk about the current status of funding for the system? Exactly. So, um, so twice in a row now, we have had our budget zeroed out in the presidential budget, but both times we have managed to do um, some very good work on Capitol Hill, um, pleading our case, um, and Congress has reinstated funding both times. So that's why we are still on track for the federal system. California, uh, state of California has also put in money for the system. So the rollout for sure will be happening in California. Um, the states of Oregon and Washington, that's still sort of under discussion. Um, but, but yeah, we've, we've managed to eke out our, our federal funding uh, for the past two years. So the hope is that that just keeps continuing. Cats or dogs? Cats? <laughs> oh, this is another one of my favorite questions, okay? Uh, you know, this, this animal, animals predicting earthquakes. Look, you know, I, I am under no delusions that, yes, somebody may have a dog or cat that's very sensitive either to the P wave shaking, because sometimes humans don't feel that if it's not a big earthquake. Maybe they felt the P wave. Is there some sound that happens that's at a frequency that I can't hear? Is there some other thing that we... We don't know, and, and animals are, are reacting to. You know, I think it's an interesting thing to, to think about. And if somebody really wants to do that as their research project, you know, more power to them. Like the more we know about things, the, the better. But 
I just don't understand the feasibility of sitting down and doing a behavioral study on animals for that sort of longevity to get enough statistics to make it significant. So dogs and cats, squirrel, you know, like they do stuff, they do stuff all the time. And so you'd have to rule out every single behavioral neurons. Does it always predicate an earthquake or does it not? And how, when's the last time we had a big, huge earthquake around here or anywhere around the world globally? Like you'd really have to document that. And that's why it's, it's anecdotal, it's interesting. I don't think it's wrong, but we have so many other sensors that can be doing this sort of thing that can look at it without some human sitting with like, did he cough? Did he? No? Okay. Okay. Did he? Did, is he smiling? I don't know. Does he look scared? Is he look, oh, there's a, there's a bigger animal. You know, like, it's just not feasible. Um, when I finally get around to doing my homework and get a go bag together, where's the best place to keep it? I mean, you said earlier about your house may collapse and you might not be able to get the things there. I mean, do you yep. keep it in the trunk of your car? Do you keep it in a barrel in the backyard? What, so what this is one of the most difficult things about earthquake preparedness because every single answer boils down to it depends, right? Your earthquake plan, it depends. You know, where you should drop to cover and hold on in your area, it depends, right? Where you should keep your stuff, it depends. Some people keep it in a shed out in the backyard. Right? Because worst case scenario, the shed gets akimbo and you can sort of break it down and get to your stuff. Other people, like myself, I live in a condo, right? The distance between my bed and my kitchen is not that far. So I just really have my go bag with all my camping stuff right next to my pantry because, you know, I was. The, there's no sense in putting it in some like crazy place, you know? And so you just have to look at, there's no right answer, right? And even if you pick the best answer, considering all of the circumstances around, it could still mess up, right? It could be the one time that this one thing fell and like who'd have thought and you can't get to it. And so having um, maybe lots of different things, maybe you have something at work, maybe you have something in your car, maybe you have something more substantial at home that you can get access to. Um, maybe you have an actual go bag somewhere, like in your garage that you think is the best place, but then you also keep in the back of your mind, I can also get to my pantry um, and have stuff like that. So yeah, all my answers are terrible, but you know, it's, it's that sort of thing where you just have to figure out what works for you and what works for you is not gonna work for him, is not gonna work for her. Um, and we're all just trying our best. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I took one of those uh, CERT classes before about neighborhood preparedness and such. Uh, was a couple questions. Was was one does does information about earthquakes ever develop and change over five or ten years and and such? And then um, tables and hiding under tables and things is uh, they talked about uh, like a golden triangle area where if something fell. Oh, no! Oh, yeah. And thanks. But this was years ago, right? So okay. I just was wondering, like, how, do, do those things change, or should everyone just get under tables? So, so, so yes, some earthquake information does change over time. Um, specifically for the earthquake, like how big it was, where it was, that doesn't change that much. It's not like you have like, oh, the Napa earthquake happened and it was a magnitude six, and ten years later we're going to be like, oh no, it was magnitude three, and it was like in Boston. Like, that, that doesn't happen. But you get like little, you know, there's a lot of researchers going and getting the exact different thing and tilting it this way and that. Um, now, the question about earthquake um, actions, that does change over time. And a lot of what is influencing that is emergency responders looking at who survived big events. And if at first you said, okay, do this, and everybody did that, but then only people that did that plus something else survived, then, um, and then that changes. And that's actually where this idea of the triangle of life started, is because people were finding people in little tiny triangles. And at first you would think, oh, then we should add this to our survival thing. But that was an issue of, uh, not causation, right? So, of course, if something falls over and you happen to be in that void space, you're not gonna get crushed, right? Ergo, you survive. However, 
all of the other people that sat against a wall and then something fell right on top of them, they didn't survive. There was no void space. And so um, it is very, very difficult to predict in the moment which way things are going to fall, right? Am I safer standing on this side of the podium or this one in an event? Well, it depends on if the podium falls this way or that way, right? If it falls this way and I was over here, I'm fine. If it falls this way and I'm here, I get squished. And so, so we do not promote triangle of life because how do you locate that triangle? And you have no idea where that triangle is, and so then it's kind of pointless. However, being under a sturdy table, a sturdy table has a good chance, even if something falls on top of it, has a good chance of holding that up. And that is always a void space, and especially if you hold on to it, you'll be fine. So I think I'm getting like hooked off the stage, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I just wanted to say what a wonderful, wonderful way to kick off summer staff appreciation. I, I learned a lot and I came in 15 minutes late, but I learned about P waves and S waves and all of the amazing apps. Um, I'm not sure about the fact that I know as much as you know. That's a little worrisome or your guess is as good as my guess. <laughs> it is, it is. Um, that's a little scary. but. Um, I, I just wanted to just stop and say thank you for being with us here today. Thank you for everything that you are doing here at UC Berkeley and also the contribution, that you, the huge contribution that you're making to the state of California and the world thank with you. your research. And thank you to all the awesome UC Berkeley staff. <laughs> Let's go home and do our homework.